Hi everyone, and welcome to Literary Loitering, the geek show's dedicated arts and books and anything related to that podcast. Uh, my name's Rob, and joining me today is Sarah. Hello. And Andrew. That one's me. And no Graham. <gasps> dun, 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 dun. He is not here this week. Or is he? No, he's not. You had me looking around my room for a second there. <laughs> I think most weeks he's not in your room. <laughs> I was actually I was actually concerned for a second there. Started looking over my shoulder to see if he was here. <laughs> I mean, I have a cupboard right behind me which is big enough for a person to hide in. So Yeah, I've got a screen in front of me which is big enough for a person to hide behind. <laughs> Uh, now we're all paranoid. I sleep in an actual shoebox, so I'm fine. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Now we're all paranoid that Graham's going to jump out at some at some point in the episode. <laughs> not unless you say his name five times. At least he's not like Beetlejuice. We made that mistake <laughs> once already. Over on phone panel, we're not allowed to say Beetlejuice again, me and Andrew, and we're not allowed whoa, to say Shazam. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Getting close there, Rob. Yeah, I know. I said it twice. I'm be- I'm keeping count. Don't worry. Uh, now I'm not allowed to say it on this again, am I? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, we like to start off uh, with a callback to some of the other things we've talked about previously. Yes, we've got previous. Um, Donald Trump Jr. wrote a book, didn't he? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Now, what was it called? Did... Triggered? Yes. Yes, I remember that. Oh, God, it was. But yeah, it was because he, he paid someone to write a book for him. Well, he potentially, did, as he, is the family tradition. Uh, oh, oh, he's he's more than just upholding the family tradition on. Uh, I mean, he's upholding the family tradition on all fronts, right? Um, mm. See, thirty years ago, Donald Trump apparently wrote a book called "The Art of the Deal" using ghostwriters. Yeah, mm-hmm. and he also reportedly ordered key staff to buy thousands of copies of "The Art of the Deal" to make it seem more popular than it was. That does sound like him. Well, guess who follows in Daddy's footsteps? Are you going to have to tell me? I just don't know. Donald Trump Jr. (laughs) (laughs) See, (laughs) he's been accused um, of inflating the sales figures for his number one bestseller by using pretty similar tactics to what his dad used and simply... Mm paying people to go out and buy as many copies of his book as possible. Oh, no, paying people as well. <laughs> that's... That's, just, that's just, just like handing out just like 20 quid. And you can you just go to Waterstones and buy my book, please? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, it's bizarre that he's doing exactly the same thing that his dad did. Uh, the New York Times bestseller list revealed its sales had been boosted by bulk purchases... <laughs> <laughs> and, um, triggered top the New York Times nonfiction chart this, uh, you know, um, last week. But the newspaper has added a dagger beside the book to indicate that some retailers report receiving bulk orders. And earlier this month, reporters pointed out that the Republican National Committee was emailing supporters, urging them to contribute funds in exchange for a signed copy of Triggered, which is subtitled. How the left thrives on hate and wants to silence us. Oh my god. Yeah, the Republican National Committee denied making bulk purchases, telling press it was ordering copies to keep up with demand. Yeah, the demand of um, Donald Trump Jr. asking them to buy them. That was the demand. He demanded that they (laughs) they bought them. Yeah. Also, it says a signed copy, but it doesn't say by who. I I just imagine it's like a hoof print. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, probably. He just like paid a thousand people to scroll in a a book for him, probably, to sign his signature. I I can't remember, were the Republicans the elephant or the donkey? Do you know, ironically, um, it's not the donkey, I don't think. I think the Democrats is the donkey. Oh, right. Okay. So it's basically like just a stamp from an elephant then. Yeah. It could be worse. I mean, uh, in a related story, in a bizarrely related story, a yeah. librarian in the US state of Idaho has said that a mysterious visitor is going into their library 
and hiding books that criticise President Donald Trump or contain liberal viewpoints. Oh, unbelievable. <laughs> Not just uh, Trump literature, books on LGBTQ issues, gun control mm. and women's suffrage have also been hidden or refiled as fiction. Oh my goodness. Refiled as fiction. Yeah, I mean, it's... <sighs> you just got to think, how? what? Why? Why would you... Why would you spend half the day taking books from one section of a library to another unless you were getting paid to do it? I don't know. It just has sort of like it smacks of Fahrenheit 451. Yeah. So, Oh, so you're suggesting maybe they are getting paid to do it. Yeah, and probably like but in some secret corner of the library. Um, the kids uh, section <laughs> yeah. with all the low tables. <laughs> The kids slash bin section, yeah. and then they just stick them all in the bin and set fire to them. I prefer the kids section with like the play tea sets and stuff like that, and they're just <laughs> <laughs> a couple of sh- a couple of shady characters there. You know, they're just pretending to have a tea party. <laughs> in our local library, they've now got a bank. <laughs> what? In, yeah, in in part of our new local library, it's been sectioned off and rented out to a bank. When you say bank, you you mean like Barclays? Financial and, institution. Yeah the, yeah, the actual, yeah, not a book yeah. bank or something like that. No. Or a blood bank or no, the other so types of bank. No, that'd be more interesting, but no, no. We've just had to, I think, they've, um, to save money and because libraries have changed like quite a lot um, and that's one of their ways of adapting to the changes. I haven't they've rented out part of their space to uh, a bank instead. Hmm, yes, interesting story, Sarah. <laughs> Thanks, I thought you would enjoy that particularly, Andrew. Yes, that's why I've been sitting here so silently. I was that enraptured. <laughs> Indeed. I thought he is going to love this. So, yeah, um, people hiding anti-Donald Trump books in the library is a thing, but the author of one of those books has decided to retaliate in kind of brilliant fashion. Someone hid one of his books. It's uh, Rick Riley, a former sports illustrated and ESPN contributor. He's the author of Commander in Cheat, How Golf Explains Trump. Someone hid his book in the Idaho Library, so he thought, okay. He... So somebody hid his book in the Idaho Library? Yeah. Well, I mean, to be fair, it wouldn't be my first choice of places to look. Well, you know, it was already in there. Somebody hid it from <laughs> other people getting it. But he mm-hmm. has responded to that by saying, okay, I'm going to take 10 other books there and hide them myself. <laughs> so, yeah. I think what you need to do is just start hollowing out like pro-Trump books and hiding your book inside them. Oh, God, it's going to be Shawshank Redemption type stuff, isn't it? I mean, if the librarians aren't doing their jobs, then yeah, certainly. <laughs> well, also, I'm pretty sure you can just walk out the front door of a library. You don't need to, like, tell your way out through a wall. <laughs> <laughs> yet, yet. Fahrenheit 451 isn't the only dystopian fiction that I, uh, that I know of involving books. There's one from Japan called Library Wars, where uh, books are considered such a rare object in the dystopian future that uh, they are protected by armed guards. And they're actually, you know, libraries are places where the librarians are literally just soldiers with guns. Man, they're going to kick themselves when they find out about Kindle. <laughs> okay. Oh, they're, they're the, the troops now to reinforce the library. <laughs> Did you just hear a train go by? Yes. Oh, God. I never, because I don't even notice them anymore. And I've got headphones on. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's all right. Anyway, interesting news. Publishers are preparing for work in publishing week. Have you guys heard of this? No. From Monday the 18th of November to Sunday the 24th of November, uh, it's pub- Work in Publishing Week, and publishers so, include... Yeah, do sorry. I have to leave my job and go and work in a publishing house? No, no, no. Okay. Publishers including and other stories, Cambridge University Press and HarperCollins, are uh, they're trying to get young people aged 14 to 24 inspired to pursue a career in publishing. And so... They're inviting young people to come and work for them, obviously for free, for a week. So we're getting kids to work for no wages for a week. 
<clears throat> Does this initiative come from Jacob Rees Mock? I don't know. Is the publishing house <laughs> just a very large factory <laughs> where the word publishing has been like haphazardly stapled over the word work? <laughs> <laughs> See, um, the national campaign also coincides with Discover Creative Careers Week, a week long event held by, sorry, led by Creative and Cultural Skills that aims to help teenagers discover the breadth of jobs on offer in the sector. And so HarperCollins will be visiting and hosting work in publishing sessions in six secondary schools in Southwark, and uh, the other publishers will be going to various others as well. Around the world? No, around the country? No, just, just mainly, surprisingly... Oh, mainly, is it just Southwark? Surprisingly, mainly down south. Shocking. Wow, you do surprise yes. me. Wow. Paint that shock all over my face. Exactly. So, um, okay, what do we know about publishing between the three of us? Well, I was wondering about, like, with the the change in the way people consume reading material. Um, I think I wondered if it was an initiative designed to sort of remind people that publishing houses exist and to try and get them on board with the whole notion of books. Um, rather than on an electronic device or um, reduced to 140 characters, 280. Yep. That could be one of the reasons for it. It's a very good reason for it as well. What about you, Andrew? You did journalism. You know a, bit, a, bit, a fair bit about publishing, don't you? No. <laughs> I'm literally completely separate industries. <laughs> you printing newspapers and publishing, aren't they the same thing? I didn't know you did journalism. I did. The cool. Journalism diploma. <sighs> Look at the heights it's got me to. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so what do you think, Andrew? Do you think this is a Jacob rees Mog plan? Or is it something that's going to get people into the exciting world of publishing? Yeah, I don't know. I feel like sure, maybe offering like work experience placement to like actual school kids you know, when they're doing a work experience week. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. That's, you know, kind of giving them plenty of opportunities to try like various careers. Mm. But I think once we're getting into the like twenty to twenty four type range, that's basically just saying, Hey, you're looking for a job in publishing, work for us for free. It's like having a job, only with none of the benefits. Yeah, basically. <laughs> I suppose it'd be like an internship at that age. I don't know. Yeah. Don't, don't interns get paid? Well, if you've got a paid internship. Okay. But not you have an unpaid internship. It really varies on that factor, yeah. So what's the difference between an unpaid intern and a volunteer? Um, let me think. No. I think the answer is Rob. <laughs> You're getting dangerously close to <laughs> the secret of big business. <laughs> right. Now I know how to get people on board. Yeah. Basically, an intern, well, an unpaid intern is like a volunteer. Only you feed them a whole lot of nonsense about <laughs> no it's great it's experience it's exposure this is going to help you go places God, the, I, I would like to know I'd, lo I'd love it if we had statistics for the amount of unpaid work people do I think it would be a phenomenal amount voluntary stuff voluntary organisations um, doing stuff for exposure doing stuff as a quid pro quo exchange Unpaid caring, everything. I was about to say the highest. Uh, yeah. The highest amount would probably be unpaid caring. Yeah, I bet yeah. it is. I bet it is. And especially like some kind of statistic for how many of those unpaid positions have then led on to like a permanent position. <laughs> Discounting the times when it's oh, and also my mum just happens to be best mates with the person who runs this company. <laughs> yeah. Ah, so anyway, uh, leaving the publishing world to one side and uh, heading to jail. Okay, well, it's been great. Ta-ra. Yeah. I have many times said that this podcast is a crime. <laughs> <laughs> Charlotte Community Library in Missouri. They made a slight boo-boo kind of thing, and now a woman is having to pay the price of it. See, Melissa Sanders-Jones, she discovered that there was a warrant out for her arrest. The mother of five uh, said her boss called her 
to inform her that she had a warrant and she had to pull over because she started laughing and he was saying, no, I'm serious. And then it turned out the warrant was for two children's books that she'd forgotten to return to the library. They were returned to the library by her uh, boyfriend two years late, but returned to the library. She went to the police station, handed herself in, but now she's going to be hauled in front of a judge for the warrant and various... Uh, and that's basically it. The library was saying that she never responded to them when they sent letters to her and tried to phone her. But then they also kind of stopped and went ahead with all sorts of litigation and stuff. I mean, that's a massive amount of money to lay out on one little book. Two little books, two little kids' books. Sorry, two little kids' books, yeah. at like a five or each or something, and thousands yeah. of pounds of litigation. Oh, it gets worse. It gets worse. See, Melissa Sanders-Jones, at the time the library was trying to contact her, was actually in a women's shelter after being in an abusive relationship and managing to successfully leave it. Oh, my God. And then the library just joined in with that abuse. Awesome. Yeah. So oh. now... <laughs> They done a bad. Exactly. Oh, they did done a bad. So Charlotte Library has refused to comment further on the Sanders Jones case, citing confidentiality. <laughs> yes, it's confidential that they are Doyles. I mean, at least get someone to check. Mm. Yeah, I think it's one of those things where it's just the person says, I'm sorry, we can't comment about that at that time. Hang up. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it's escalated now it, um, I mean she, uh, uh, Melissa Sanders-Jones is waiting to uh, waiting for her next court hearing and hoping that she can persuade the judge to drop the charges because at the end of the day it's matters beyond her control she's got a huge amount of mitigation for that for that yeah. case though and she, she had to change her phone she couldn't get the uh, the Train! Mail. <laughs> that is staying in, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa Sanders Jones, she couldn't get a mail from her old address because her boyfriend still lived there and kept phoning her, mm. so she had to change her phone number. Yeah, they have to allow for that, surely. It's completely beyond her control. Exactly. And it would have it would have resulted in damage or danger danger, personal endangerment. And she got two kids' books out. So there's kids involved, so it's endangering the kids as well. Yeah. I'm just confused by the fact that you can arrest people for unpaid library fines. Yeah. I mean, it seems a bit OTT, doesn't it? I mean, uh, I, I've i never heard of anyone in the UK being arrested for unpaid library fines. No. Yeah, I, mean, I think it was just like, like parking tickets, where just if you don't pay it, it just kind of hangs about. You get a CCJ mm. against you eventually because it goes in front of a magistrate. And then mm. that's your credit limit basically screwed, isn't it? Mm. You can use ClearScore or whatever service you want. It will say, nope, you're not getting a loan. <laughs> yeah, but you also don't, like, have spot bursting down the doors, you know, tackling you to the ground and hauling in front of the judge. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, that would be... <laughs> that's Fahrenheit 451 right there. <laughs> We're arresting you for the crime of reading. See Spot Run, Run Spot Run. <laughs> Possession of a book with intent to read. <laughs> <laughs> Loiter uh, malicious lingering in a library. <laughs> or literary loitering, as it's also known. <laughs> See what I did there? Yes, we saw what you did there. And it was good. <laughs> it was very good. <laughs> Oh, right. Okay. So, um, moving on to John Burko. Is it time-dependent, time time-specific? No, it's just... It's one of those. updated by the time he gets around to it. It's one of those ones where uh, he would narrate it better than I would. Mm, you just have a way. Um, it's about audiobooks and stuff like that, so I'm going to oh. let him do it, because it's not actual news, it's more of a, a piece on it. Mm, okay. So anyway, moving on to John Burko, the oh, cool. the now former Speaker of the House of Commons. <laughs> so yeah, he has announced that he is going to be publishing 
a candid memoir. A, <laughs> you know, it, it's John Burko's. I'd expect no, nothing less. No holds barred, tell all expose of everything that goes on in the House of Commons. And it's called Unspeakable. Oh, clever. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's an all right title in it. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I I honestly thought he was going to go with order because that's what everyone knows. Job at McDonald's. <laughs> well, to be fair, they all did say that word. That is all of their lines. Yeah. <laughs> so um, order. <laughs> order. 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 Get a very distinctive order. Yeah. Like, order. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I say it, that I'm not sure if I've ever actually heard John Burkow speak so much as just like the dead ringers impersonation of him. That's it, yes, that's where I was going. <laughs> See, now that he's left the House of Commons, I mean, uh, if he sticks a V on the end of that, it could be a tasty treat. House of Commons V. No, no, uh, on the end of order. Order. <laughs> Sir, madam, would you like an order? <laughs> well, I mean, he's finished his job now. He's probably looking around for work. So, I mean, there's always yeah. waiting jobs. Yes, there are. You can go and beat some waiting staff. I know. Uh, order of works, you know, it doesn't. Saying canopy just doesn't. Have a <laughs> doesn't quite work. <laughs> It's really awful, like a canopy, though. It is. Sorry. <coughs> Sorry, just dying. <sighs> and then there were two. <laughs> is it going to be a thing ending where we just have to stare at each other and then the camera slowly pans out? <laughs> oh, big pardon, chaps. No worries. Um, but, yeah, um, Unspeakable will... Uh, well, it's going to be an eye opener because uh, last week. Oh, oh, I don't like that. That's mixing your metaphors, John Burkow. Yeah, last week Burkow <laughs> said in an interview with the Observer that Cameron feels he is born to rule, and that Brexit is the biggest mistake of this country after the war. Unspeakable will also explain the ways in which Burkow, son of a cab driver in North London, has sought to democratize the business of Parliament using the speakership to champion the rights of backbench MPs and hold the government to account. Good lad. So, yeah, I might actually sit down and read this. There's very few people whose uh, biographies or autobiographies I would consider reading. Uh, and John, Bur- John Burko is one of them. Yeah, yeah, he's an interesting character, I think. He, he does, there's something about him that makes you go, oh, yeah, he's quite interesting. I mean, uh, if you look at his personal history, he was a very right-wing Tory at the beginning of his career. Yeah. And now he's a lot more liberal. I mean, he married a Labour MP, didn't he? Did he? Well, was it a Labour MP or was it someone from grassroots Labour? I can't remember. But yeah, his wife is definitely Labour. Right. Which I think has helped temper some of his uh, more right-wing ideologies and tendencies. And... You know, he's reached that age where he's now looking at things with a more measured view. And I suppose being the Speaker for 10 years as well, he's seen... Yeah. He's seen the worst that the House of Commons has to offer, for definite. Yeah. It's been an extraordinary period to be Speaker, definitely. Um, what, who's What's the name of that guy? William Haig. I think he he was the same way. I think he was a lot more right-wing when he was younger. And I think he's tempered his views as well. I think he's much more moderate now. Yeah, he's a lot more moderate now, but uh, you know, he's he still likes to think that he's very, very Yorkshire. But you know, yeah, he'll never be Doctor Who. Is that a trait of people from Yorkshire, though? What that they're very, very Yorkshire. Yeah, I don't know. I like that uh, joke. I like that more, joke. More a trait of people from Yorkshire than people not from Yorkshire. But it's like that joke about um, how can you tell a person from Yorkshire? Oh, they'll tell you. <laughs> it's the same thing about vegans. Same gag. Uh, right, okay. I get it now. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was about how they uh, don't say H. It's what not... do they say? Well, they just don't say H. What, do they say H, or do they just never pronounce the H? They never H? pronounce the H. So it's oh, not Halifax. Yeah, so it's not Halifax. Halifax, it's Halifax. Halifax. Mm. And... From steps. 
(laughs) (laughs) So when does this tell sensational publication, when does it release? Um, Let's have a look. Does he have to write it? Well, he's, uh, he's got a publisher for it. It's not you out anytime soon, I think. I bet he's got a publisher lined up and he'll be keeping like diary or something. So it just needs collating Hmm. and sort of curating. Yeah. Speaking of book sales, uh, Judy Dench, Dame Judy Dench, has uh, appealed to the public for help to bring a rare Bronte book back to the UK as the auction for it looms on the horizon. Uh, The... uh, it's a miniature book by the teenage Charlotte Bronte, and it could fetch at least £650,000 in Paris next week at Hayworth's Parsonage, uh, sorry, and Hayworth's Parsonage Museum hopes to buy it with crowdfunding. And how much is it? It could fetch up to £650,000. Oh, so I suspect wow. it would be a crowd, crowdfunding thing. Are they going Probably to sell the parsonage? Was, was kind of hoping that Judy Dench was trying to organise the country into like one massive heist. <laughs> <laughs> and it was written in the eight, in 1830 when uh, Charlotte Bronte was uh, 14. The manuscript measures just 35 millimetres by 61 millimetres and features three handwritten stories, one of which describes a murderer who is driven into madness when he is haunted by his victims. It's been wow. in, yeah, it's been in private ownership since the death in eighteen fifty five of Charlotte, <gasps> uh the longest lived of the literary sisters, and it is one of six tiny booklets produced by the writer at the Parsonage in Hayworth. Has nobody or seen Hallworth. it since then? Uh only five are known to have survived and the museum owns the remaining four of the little books. So this is the only other book only other one of the little books that's outside wow. the uh Parsonage Museum's uh hands. Yeah. Has it always been in France? Um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, apart from when it was in the 1830s. Uh, it doesn't say. Right. But there's only a couple of days left before the actual auction, and so... Uh, they... oh, damn it, I don't get paid until next month. Oh, you can chuck in a quid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's one of those things where you look at it and you go... Yeah, I I get it. I understand why it's important to bring this back. But by the same token, surely we could give the Elgin marbles back to Greece then? Yeah, I know it's this this is the eternal debate, isn't it? I I can I get that. I I think they're very keen to get the Elgin marbles marbles back, marbles. <laughs> Um, but I think they're very keen to get Miriam Margulies back and uh, <laughs> I, I I don't understand why we're hanging on to the Elgin marbles because they're not ours and, and various mummies and, you know, like wholesale ransacking of co- uh, countries and nicking all their stuff. And... Yeah. I mean, uh, it, it's funny because the British have one story about how the how we got the El- Elgin marbles, but the, the Greeks have a very different story. I'm sure they do. Um, the Greek... Nobbins came around and nicked our marbles. They have to... Everyone knows those marbles fell off the back of a truck. <laughs> a very big truck. <laughs> and we're just holding on to them for a while. <laughs> Until we Safety. find the real owners. <laughs> <laughs> they were resting in our accounts. <laughs> Can you prove you are the real owner of the marbles? <laughs> Do you have any photo evidence <laughs> of them being placed there? Can you imagine? I mean, how many... How many artefacts in this country didn't originate in this country? There must be just millions. Well, technically all of them never evolved people separately from the rest of humanity, so everyone's a, an immigrant here. Like an artefact? I'm being, I'm being, what is it, facetious or pedantic? I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Artefacts-wise, though, I mean, you know those uh, those treasure hoards that people keep finding and stuff, stuff like that? I suppose they are they originated here, but uh, I don't know. Do we have gold mines in the UK? Oh, uh, I think in Wales. The Welsh have gold. I think so. I knew there was a reason I liked Wales. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Now I'm going to be like uh, one of those weird prospectors from the old west. 
<laughs> you know, padding for gold in the Welsh Valleys. Even though there's a working mine there. <laughs> so, anyway, um, do you remember Lucy Ullman uh, wrote a thousand pages that were just basically one long sentence? Ah, uh, yes. Yes, we mentioned that last episode. Yep. Oh, is this the one where there's like three full stops in the whole thing? Mm, something like that. Yeah, um, it missed out on the Booker Prize, but it ha- du- but Ducks Newburyport has won the £10,000 pr- £10, prize for fiction, which is the Goldsmiths Prize. That's the book that is supposed to be endless. It's a very long book, is it? Yeah, I know. Weirdly enough, it's not the first time I've uh, I've encountered this sort of uh, this sort of stuff. There's a local author wrote uh, a book called Ten Story Love Song. Oh, I've heard of that. And Who was it? I'm trying to remember his name. It was. Um... Oh, did he do the one about oh, apples or Eden or yeah. something, something about? Yeah, I forgot his name now. It was uh, Richard. Yeah. I mean, Richard Millward, that's it. That's it. Yeah, and the way he did Ten Story Love Song, he didn't use any paragraphs, so it was just basically all a column of text. Ah, right, and it was about love. Yeah, and so it's not the first time I've encountered uh, using the text in a specific way, using using the actual mm. uh, sentence structure, paragraphs, whatever, in a specific way, but uh, the Goldsmiths Prize for fic- is for fiction at its most novel and was praised by judges as a masterpiece. It's a stream-of-consciousness internal monologue of a mother in Ohio as she bakes pies in her kitchen. Yeah. Do you think sometimes these book awards, it gets quite late and they realise, oh, no, we haven't actually read any of these. Okay, Mm -hmm. this one's got the most words, therefore it is the best book. I think that's it. Probably. So many words per money in this one. Yeah, <laughs> I think though this is possibly one of the greatest sentences that I've seen, and I mean that very, very sarcastically. Oh no! If you're going to be reading from the book, this is us for like the next nine hours. Oh no, no, n- not from the book. This is from the. This is. Let's see. This is a commentary from the Goldsmiths Prize. They set out to reward fiction that breaks the mould or extends the possibilities of the novel form. What does that mean, extends the possibilities of the novel form? Is it going to be like pages within pages that open out onto other pages? Are are you going to add pictures? Because then it's a comic. (laughs) Yeah, uh, it makes it sound like a centrefold, but um, yeah, I think just sort of like playing with the, the whole notion of what a novel is um and this person lucy elman has obviously thought you know novels are all very well but what they really need is fewer full stops and more words yeah yeah i'm glad someone's finally broken into the bold new category of what if books were just harder to read (laughs) (laughs) My main Abandoned issue with this, thirty pages. Yeah, my main issue with this wow. is that old thing. Uh, when is a book not a book? You know, like, well, when it's yeah. a film, when it's a song, when it's a comic, when it's a video game, when it's a board game, when it's anything other than a book, but something what? that still tells a it. story. When is a book not a book? It's a bloody pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> That's because you picked the wrong... That didn't have the softest pages. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't th- hasn't this already been invented, though? I mean, we there was a whole, like, section of literature that was stream of consciousness. Yeah. You know, when it was first sort of thought up in the early part of last century. Well, I, I was about to say, there were a few of the stream of consciousness novels in uh, the 50s and 60s. And I know, uh, I know there was... One uh, that came out after the Vietnam War in America, which was uh, all about uh, a soldier coming back, and uh, it was one of the, uh, I think it was one of the inspirations for uh, you know the film Jacob's Ladder. Oh yeah, I think uh, I think it was one of the inspirations for that. All oh, right, that would have been really interesting actually, because he was 
Oh, he had, he was given drugs, wasn't he? The character. Yeah. And that I think stream of consciousness consciousness seems like it would be particularly appropriate for that. Yeah. So it's yeah, not it's so- kind of weird. Google you, what's going on? Yeah. I mean, that's probably through that sentence that the words I was trying to look for to describe that were stream of consciousness. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like in action as it's happening, breaking news. <laughs> <laughs> Weirdly and, enough. And I suppose something like um, to the lighthouse or um, uh, something where you, it's somebody's. Uh, frame of mind and the anxiety and the worries and the concerns and the hang-ups about that person's mind and those are the thoughts that are racing and scrambling and messed up. So, um, okay. so that that would make it an appropriate use of the form. Yeah. It's just, uh, you know, it's still a book. It is, yeah. <laughs> so you're yeah. not extending... That's nice. It's a book. I mean, at the most basic level, it's between two covers and it contains a lot of words. On pages, so it's on still pages above... in sentences and things. So, how does that extend the possibility of the novel form? I've not read it. I mean, I have to say, <laughs> no, I I'm read just it. saying, if it's, it's between, thousand pages, if it's a thousand pages between two covers and contains a lot of words, that's still a book. It's still a book, but there's something about it. Obviously, it's still a book. It's got thousand words. It's still between two covers. It's still a book. It contains a stream of consciousness, which is still a book. And it's not particularly original as a concept, but maybe she's done something even more original with it. I wouldn't know. I've not read it. Okay, cool. (laughs) I I think we probably shouldn't be dunking too hard on this book we have not read, but (laughs) God, does it sound so tedious. (laughs) (laughs) Slightly disingenuous. Yeah. Uh, Anyway, uh, something nice. A woman has been reunited with a copy of The Secret Garden that she used to own as a child and was serendipitously discovered for sale on the shelves of the Museum of English Rural Life Shop. So she bought it again for uh, 50 pence. Oh, oh bless her. Oh, well, did it have like an inscription or anything inside it? Yeah. Put a name in it originally. Well, she, it wasn't her name. It was her sister's name in the front cover. It was written in characters that she'd dreamed up as a child. And so when she saw the uh, children's classics edition of The Secret Garden, the Ladybird children's classics edition, um, she saw it in the charity shop and she thought, oh, that brings back memories. And then she opened it up and saw her sister's name in that handwriting. And she thought, oh, my God, this is the one from this. This is mine. That's Aww. really cool. That's very cool. That's really sweet. She had a grid on a sheet of paper with a key as to what each of the symbols meant. That made up her sister's name because it was like you know how kids play with chords and stuff like that. Yeah. And so they basically did something like that, and she made that in ninety three, ninety four. So it's been twenty six years since then, which I thought was uh, quite nice. And Graham obviously thought the same as well since he it found is, this it's article. It's very sweet. But, 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 we're gonna have some fun now because this is a story that Graham didn't have, but I found. Okay. Right. So. You know the word of the year? Yes. Right. It's usually it? the Oxford English was Dic- now. What was you the word? You said a couple of weeks ago, didn't you? Yeah. What was the word of the year? Does anyone remember? Oh, uh, it was something that we thought we already, it was already in the dictionary and what what was, isn't it, do we already know this anyway? Yeah. Yeah. No. Like selfie or something that's already taken it, a place. Was it selfie? Was it selfie? No, I don't think it was selfie. It was uh, something else, wasn't it? Oh, I forgot. Do you not just have the answer, Rob? Well, no. Do you have you <laughs> led us down this merry trail without a guide? <laughs> we lost in the woods for confusion. All I'm saying is that the word of the year for this year, no, that wasn't the word of the year. It was a words that it was words that were added to the English language to the Oxford English Dictionary. Sorry, we made a mistake. The word of the year. Oh, hasn't come right. But uh, Collins Dictionary have kind of uh, got the jump on everybody. Right. Uh, because they've released their word of the year early, and their word of the year this year is climate strike. That's one word, is it? No, it's two words. Okay. See where I have a problem with this. <laughs> no integrity anymore. So, uh, it's climate strike thanks to Greta Thunberg and Extinction Rebellion, which I think is great. Yes. 
But it's still yeah, two words. One of those things is really cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the choice was revealed in a new list of, sorry, in a list of new and notable words compiled by Collins lexicographers. Climate strike was first registered in November 2015 when the first event of that name took place to coincide with the US, UN Climate Change Conference in Paris. Other picks include rewilding, which is the practice yeah. of, re- of returning wild uh, of returning land to a wild state. Bopo. Does anyone know what bopo means? Is it B O P O? Yeah. Uh, bo- is it something population? Nope. Oh, I don't know. Short word for body positivity. Ah, oh, right. Yeah. Hope punk. Hope punk. Yeah. <laughs> I've never heard of that for sort. Andrew? I think that is the like fantasy role playing character I make up who can <laughs> devastate her enemies with her mighty climate strike. <laughs> <laughs> climate strike It's uh, a Choose word a weapon for that. Yeah. It's a word first uh first used in twenty seventeen by writer Alexandra Rowland. It's one of those made up words, you know, like dubstep. Um it <laughs> emphasizes the positive messages of hope and optimism exemplified in TV shows like The Great British Bake Off. Is it not just a, 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 another word for traditional? Yeah, you might say nice. that. Nice. Yeah. You've invented the word Sweet. nice is what you've done. <laughs> I mean, other words on Colin's uh, word of the year shortlist were uh, entryists. Entryists? Not. Okay, so what's entryists? Well, entryists, are, it's taken from the word entryism, which is um, it, it, it's a political strategy in which an organization or state encourages its members or supporters to join another, usually larger organization, in an attempt to expand influence and expand their ideas and program. So entryists would be the people performing the entryism into an organization. That just sounds wrong. <laughs> right. Uh, double down. Yeah, I don't know why. People performing the entryism just <laughs> makes me upset deep in my bones. Exactly. Uh, yeah, it it does sound like like it'll grate on your ears because it's not entering or entry, uh, and it's ex- encouraging you take to take a like a bit of a step forward into like a movement more as. Like a, as in a group of people kind of movement, rather than somebody moving forward through into something. Yeah, <laughs> if that makes sense. And uh, other words include double down. Yeah, that's a new one. That's a fairly like last last few years. There's only a handful of years that's been around. I, three or four. Well, no, I mean it's been around for for a while, isn't it? A, a term from uh, blackjack. It's been sort of quite a. It feels like it's really grown in prominence over the past uh, couple of yeah. two or three years. Um, okay, one that has always been around and hasn't really grown in prominence, cancelled. What? Cancelled. Cancelled? Yeah, the word cancelled. Oh, is it used in a different, in a new context? Nope. So it's just the word um, Well, no, I don't think to it is, like, there has been a kind of paradigm shift to mean, like, a cancelled thing is not just a thing that is, like, was in production and has now been stopped, but it's now a more general, this person is bad type thing. Oh, really? really? You say somebody is cancelled? Yeah. Like Trump is cancelled? So, I think that is the very phrase that is often not uttered. See, that, really? That sounds really oh. sinister to me. If you say this I think, person... I think you might even have been the one who came up with this. <laughs> I mean, that, that just sounds really sinister. It just sounds like this person is cancelled and then you never see them again. Like they've been deleted. Well, you remember that Doctor Who episode with the bizarre version of uh, The Weakest Link with the robot uh, what's her face Yeah, it is very much the thing that you're cancelled and then hitting the hidden switch under the desk. Yeah. <laughs> uh, deep fake, which, you know... Oh, yeah! That's one of the ones that I think would have been a contender for the Collins Word of the Year. I think it's a contender for Word of the Year given yes. some of the stuff that they've done with it. Does it have a high enough profile? It has a novelty, and it really strikes like a big, clear bell. 
I don't know whether it has the profile. Or... Yeah, uh, non-binary. Yeah, fair dues. Yeah, which uh, I've got no problem with. And influencer. Oh, yeah, I suppose. But that is, that's an old one, though, isn't it? I mean, well, it's, that's it, been going for I I think, more, more than a decade, surely. Well, the, the term influencer, I think, it, it's been around for a long time, but I think it's just in the last year. I mean, in year, particular to social media. Yeah, I think in the last year it's become more prominent, especially with the rise of, uh, I, I mean, uh, with the rise of marketing trends and the, with the rise of, like, shopping trends and people becoming more sheep-like. Mm. So uh, I think the the whole point of an influencer has become more prominent, even though I would hate to consider myself as an influencer of any sort. Makes me well, I've got cringe. very good news for you, Rob. I was going to say, that's lucky. <laughs> I, yeah, I know I'm really lucky in that respect, in that no one takes any influence <laughs> from me. <laughs> I could, could you imagine if someone listened to this podcast and use it, like based their life decisions on? <laughs> that would be bad. That would be very, been, very like, a bad. solid ten minutes slagging off a book that we've not read and have like had a fair <laughs> synopsis for. That is a fair point. I, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> don't do it, kids. Don't don't take life advice from this podcast. Just just laugh <laughs> along with us. That life advi- take the life advice to not take our life advice. <laughs> yes. Just laugh along with us, then go to be go to bed. Okay. <laughs> now go to beard. <laughs> well, it is Movember, isn't it? Yeah. So anyway. yeah, I, th- I think influence has been around longer, and I think it's sort of not as it. And obviously, it's been around for decades. But like in specifically, like with relating to social media, I think that's been around longer. Like I think yeah. it's been around about a decade. So anyway, uh, Graham left us with one final thing. Uh, which I am putting into the chat for you guys. Um, it is the Merriam-Webster time traveller in which you can put in the date and find out which words were around, where, uh, what, which words appeared during your, the year of your birth. Oh. Let's mm-hmm. have a look. Oh, here we go. Bidding. Okay, 1991. 3D <laughs> printer. African American vernacular English, <laughs> AHA, Arnold Palmer. No, can I, can I, 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 did you say? Did you say AHA? That's AHA, as in the band. <laughs> oh, yeah, but it's all capitalized, though. Oh, no, Palmer is a cold beverage with iced tea mixed with lemonade. Mm. Do you know what the first one on mine is? Adult mm. onset diabetes. <laughs> <laughs> I look at it and going. Ah, uh, that's bad. So in constellation, I, I have scrolled down a bit, and another one of the words from 1991 is cybersex and cybercrime. I mean, from 1975. <laughs> and hoochie. <laughs> Olive Ridley, what uh, is that? One trick the, pony. Oh, one trick pony. From, from 1975, I've got adult onset diabetes, airball, alternative rock, anti-macho. <laughs> Keto Uh What was it? A uh, baked, baked. I was, <laughs> I was baked. Oh, it was a uh-huh. arena football. Asian tiger mosquito. Wow, bungee yeah. jump. Huh, how about that? Um, so yeah, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy is also one from my. Uh, <laughs> oh god, <laughs> it gets worse. That that, and then continuous. Positive airway pressure, um, creme anglaise, CT scanner, CAT scan, CAT scanner, curb appeal, date rape, <laughs> debit Ooh, card. That, that, that took a turn. That I took know. a turn. That went down a... <laughs> I'm like, wow. Um, Big Bang Theory. Gender bender. <laughs> uh, <laughs> whatever the hell G-rated means. <laughs> Micro miniaturization. Microwave oven. It's, it's... Sovietologist. <laughs> what? Wow. <laughs> Ticker. Oh, Edgy. God. I'm not looking at my own year. I'm looking at random years. You... <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> Sovietologist. <laughs> nice try. <laughs> oh, God. The word phallocratic is from my birth year. <laughs> what the hell does that mean? Phallocratic? <laughs> oh, that? wow. Oh, I what have to know what word? this means. 
relating oh, to... Can you imagine res- phallocratic entryists? <laughs> <laughs> relating to or resulting from or advocating masculine power and dominance. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's what it sounds like, funnily enough. Oh, I ha- Let's uh, have a look. I think phallocratic entryists is a new insult for people there, Andrew. Adsorbent. Anti-feminist. What? Anti-feminist is from 1900. Is it? Yeah. Anti-macho is from 1975, the year when phallocratic also appeared. Atomic layer deposition is from 1991. (laughs) Apparently Smash Mouth are also from 1975. Dodgeball, 1900. Easter Bunny, 1900. Yeah. Fistulous Withers. <laughs> <laughs> and please welcome my next guest, Fistulous Withers. Uh, he sounds like... Fistulous a... Wizard Withers. Phallocratic entryist. <laughs> he sounds like, you know, the lead, the lead of one of those uh, <laughs> albeit banjo bands from the Deep South. <laughs> Ooh, look at this it goes way back 1800 what have we got in 1800 academic year aspirator berserk <laughs> how far back does it actually go the 12th what's the first word before the 12th century <gasps> really yeah whoa before the 12th century what have we got Aaron well you know Kelsopris, Abel, Kelsopri, Adam, Abraham. Yeah. It's just names from the Bible. <laughs> Almighty. <laughs> Antichrist. Balaam. They've got Michael Mass. Yes, which we still obviously religiously celebrate every year. Exactly. Beowulf. <gasps> Beelzebub. Oh, Black Pepper, though. That's a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently Candle they had mask. Vulcans in the before the twelfth century. <laughs> <laughs> Christendom, Christmas, church, churchly. Lots of kind of church based words here. <laughs> Dane law. Again, maybe not surprising. Not surprising. No flags, obviously. <laughs> Grendel. What's a cooking stool? Oh, it's the same as a ducking stool. Is it? Yeah, apparently. Uh, you know when you are a cook or a cuckold? Oh, like a right. Cuckold, and then you, yeah, you have so to. So basically dip, for adulterers. I think so. Yeah, I think somebody who's, who's been adulterous or somebody who's been cheated on, maybe. <sighs> Lazarus Levi. No surprises here. I think we're getting lost in a sea of words now. So Just I think words. possibly it's time to end the show. <laughs> yeah, see, I do like to imagine the image of us all just like the end of Terminator 2 sinking into a big vat of words <laughs> just giving a single thumbs up as we go <laughs> <laughs> yeah sounds about right so um, that's us for this week if you want to find any of our previous episodes you'll find them on our website thegeekshow.co.uk or you'll find them on uh, any podcast provider we're on all of them so uh, do check us out if you're listening through any kind of service like that, then uh, leave us a rating, leave us a review. It does help us improve. It does help us with exposure. On our website, you'll also find our Patreon. So if you want to show your spot, then you can do so. Uh, that's all for now, then. We'll see you in a fortnight. Until then, I've been Rob. I've been Andrew. Acute flaccid myelitis. <laughs> 2014. I've been Sarah. Bye. <laughs> we'll see you all later. Thanks for listening. (laughs) Livermorium.